This is CBC Here and Now. Made that way. Hearing from the company that the cleanup is complete, but we can see that there's been no cleanup effort made whatsoever on the beaches. Tonight, the company behind a massive salmon die off says the cleanup is complete, but new video from the weekend shows salmon fat all along the shoreline. And stowaways found on board a ship docked in Argentia will tell you what we've learned about this vessel. And Meg Roberts is co-hosting with me tonight, and she's live, as you can see, at the Delta. Meg. There are about 3,700 incorporated community organizations across the province. Dozens of them are meeting today. We'll have the reason why coming up on Here Now. Good evening, I'm Anthony Germain. We start tonight with a controversial salmon die-off a few weeks back that raised a lot of questions about salmon farming. The company, Northern Harvest Sea Farms, says it has finished cleaning up all 2.6 million dead fish at its south coast operation. However, exclusive video obtained by Here and Now raises questions about just how complete that cleanup really is. You can see fat at the top of the cages. Now, these fish died in early September at the aquaculture project in Fortune Bay. In a post on social media, Northern Harvest said as of this past Friday, all the dead salmon have been removed from the affected sites. The company says warmer than normal water temperatures led to the mass mortalities. Now, at one point, the cleanup was put on hold when a diver had to be treated for decompression sickness or the bends. Now, while the company says all the dead fish have been removed, critics say the work just isn't finished. There's been no cleanup effort made whatsoever on the beaches. They're all lined with about an inch of salmon fat and this sticky substance just gets onto everything and there's no way uh, I can see it coming off anytime soon. Fact that there's lots more to talk about with this story and we'll have more of uh, my conversation with the Conservation Society in about 30 minutes. PUB Chair Roger Grimes is telling the oil and gas industry that it needs to speak up and counter the message of climate activists in this province who are marching and organizing to shut it down. That story coming up. What we're talking about now is what is the collective impact? What is the collective strength of all of these organizations together? Community groups that depend heavily on volunteers met in St. John's today and they had a big request for the provincial government. We'll find out what that was a little bit later. The Canadian Border Services Agency says it responded to a call at the port of Argentia yesterday. An anonymous source told CBC News that three stowaways were found on a ship there. The Canadian Border Services Agency has confirmed that it is questioning three individuals who arrived in the port on Sunday. Here now is Mark Quinn reports from Argentia. Behind me is the port of Argentia. It's a secure facility, so we can't shoot within its gates. But it's here that Canadian Border Services Agency officials say they boarded a vessel on Sunday morning and removed three people who were being described as stowaways. The cargo ship BBC Cape is the only vessel tied on in Argentia. But authorities won't confirm this is the ship that was boarded by federal officials on Sunday. An online source says this vessel came here to Newfoundland from Bilbao, Spain. Bilbao has been in the news recently following numerous reports of illegal immigrants boarding ships in the Spanish port. In late September, the BBC reported 21 stowaways arrived in the UK from Bilbao. And in June, the Irish Times described Bilbao as a new destination for UK-bound stowaways. Canadian Border Services agency officials are giving no details. They say privacy legislation prevents them from discussing them. They say three individuals were examined by CBSA and processed in accordance with Canadian law and were then transported to St. John's for final processing. The federal officials also said the ship's captain and the shipping line are fully cooperating with CBSA. The RCMP confirms it was involved but is not saying anything further. Port of Argentia officials also confirmed Border Services officials boarded a vessel on Sunday, but they're saying nothing else. Mark Quinn, CBC News, Argentia. The Deputy Grand Chief of the Innu Nation says he's surprised and grateful for all of the support that his community received over the weekend. From Sheheshi drowned on Saturday. She was reported missing just after 1.30 in the morning and volunteers spent the next 13 hours searching for her. 
Etienne Rich says he was thankful for all the people who searched from their boats as well as others who brought food. He says the loss is a huge blow to the small community and Rich is encouraging everyone to pull together to support the young woman's family. The trial for a woman charged in a car crash that killed a teenager started today in Cornerbrook Supreme Court. Neela Blanchard is charged with dangerous operation of a motor vehicle in the death of Justin Hines. Hines was 17 at the time and he was walking to school in Cowhead when he was struck and killed. The trial's first witnesses were two RCMP officers. They told the court about Hines sneakers and described blood on the road and how his schoolwork was scattered around the area. The incident took place at an intersection in Cowhead as Blanchard was on her way to work at the fish plant. Her trial is expected to last seven days. Former Premier Roger Grimes delivered a blunt message to the oil and gas industry that climate activists are running away with the public conversation. Grimes is chair of the Public Utilities Board and he urged pro-oil groups to speak up and counter groups such as Decarbonize NL and the young people who are following Greta Thunberg and marching against climate change. Today, Premier Dwight Ball weighed in on Grimes' comments. Here now, Zach Gowdy with that story. In the public battle over climate change, there's little doubt which side has the momentum. No more coal! No more oil! Keep your carbon in the soil! People the world over, especially young people, are marching, organizing, and demanding action on what they see as the biggest issue of our time. More than ever, we need political representatives who represent us and our values and not corporations! Leading the public dialogue are global activists like Greta Thunberg and local groups like Decarbonize NL. Now the oil and gas industry is being urged to speak up and counter that message by none other than Roger Grimes. Don't lose the ground to people who want to say, if you keep doing this, you're going to destroy the planet. Grimes is chair of the Canada Newfoundland Offshore Petroleum Board. He was speaking at a seminar about oil and gas development in central Newfoundland. Anyone in this room that hasn't heard the name Greta Thunberg? You know, so they bring a message. And if it's just that message getting out there, then you'll get politicians starting to respond to it. The proposition doesn't have to be develop oil and gas or save the environment. So again, you've got to get out with the message and say, but you can do both. Just how to do both remains a mystery. Extracting oil and burning it in our cars and trucks already accounts for well over half of provincial greenhouse gas emissions, and the province has set a goal of doubling oil production. When asked about Grimes' comments today, Premier Dwight Ball responded with the kind of message that Grimes urged the oil industry to use. We need to prepare. There's no question. There's a global movement on to reduce fossil fuels, but as it exists today, the world needs about 96 million barrels of oil. What I do know is that when you look at the carbon intensity per barrel, we have some of the best oil in the world. While he stopped short of endorsing Grimes' comments, it's clear the Premier believes in their message that the oil and gas industry must be part of this province's future, a future that climate activists believe won't be there if we don't stop burning fossil fuels. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. A very different story depending on where you were across the province today. Take a look at some of these temperatures. 9 degrees for Cornerbrook, 11 in Port Basque. But then you head towards the northeast coast and those temperatures very different. Uh, we can thank Northerly Flow for that. And you can uh, see we've got some pretty strong winds up through Twillingate. These are current wind gusts, 60, uh, 50 to 60 kilometer per hour winds. Uh, as we speak and as we head through the night tonight, the low pressure is going to continue. That's offshore right now responsible for those cooler temperatures and stronger winds is actually going to move closer uh, towards the island and that means those winds are going to pick up even more so. But this ridge of high pressure will be in play over the next couple of days. I'll have all those details coming up. Stressed and frustrated, that's how one Memorial University student says he's feeling after falling prey to a scam when he applied for a fraudulent job on the school's student employment portal. And now he's out thousands of dollars. And as CBC Investigates discovered, Munn wasn't the only post-secondary institution that was targeted. Here now is Jen White with that story. Fatal Sala is a student studying at Memorial. We're not showing his face or using his voice because of safety concerns unrelated to this story. He was looking for a part-time job in June, 
when he came across a posting for a Ventix Corporation for a junior accountant. Are you currently at a local university and looking for part-time accounting experience? We have immediate openings in our accounting group. He was sent a check for more than $5,000 and told to deposit it by phone or ATM. Saleh says he felt those instructions were odd, so he went to his local TD branch for a teller to verify the check before depositing the cash. He then received emailed instructions telling him to keep some of the money for himself and to use the rest to buy Bitcoin for a client. He later noticed his account was an overdraft. Saleh contacted his employer. He ignored my email and responded with a new email, asking about the other checks that he sent. Then at that point, I noticed there is something fishy going on. This situation is rare. Jennifer Brown says the university posts about 4,000 job ads a year, and each one is thoroughly reviewed. We generally look at, uh, make sure that the phone number, uh, the website, uh, emails, different things like that are all accurate. How did this ad squeeze through? Brown says it comes down to the fine details. They're becoming more and more sophisticated. They are using legitimate companies to look like uh, they are legitimate. They may take an email address that is one letter off from what the uh, accurate email address is. In this case, the email address had an extra T in the company's name. As it turns out, Sala is not the only person to raise concerns. A spokesperson for Aventix says several Canadian universities contacted the company in May. Aventix confirmed that these ads were fraudulent and we asked the universities to take the ads down immediately. We cannot speculate how or why our company name was used. A CBC News investigation found that this posting appeared on student job boards at schools in four other provinces. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre says it received a report of a second victim from Ontario. Brown says post-secondary institutions in Atlantic Canada are now working together. They started a shared database in June to track these fraudulent job ads. Talks are now underway to hopefully make a national database. In the meantime, Memorial University is educating students about scams and what red flags to look out for. As for Fatal Sala, he's taking his bank to small claims court over allegations of negligence. In a statement to CBC Investigates, TD says deposited funds are subject to the bank's policy and that once the funds are available, a check can still be returned if it's found to be fraudulent. TD says it's always important for a customer to be comfortable with the transaction and to be aware of who you are accepting checks from. Now Salah says the bank has closed his account and his debt was sent to a collections agency. His small claims lawsuit is still before the courts. Jen White, CBC News, St. John's. Well, are you or somebody that you know a champion of human rights? The Human Rights Commission of Newfoundland and Labrador is looking for nominations for its annual Human Rights Award. That award recognizes an individual, living or deceased, who has made a contribution to advancing and furthering human rights in this province. The deadline for nominations is October 31st. Had people in the past who are more high-profile uh, award win winners that are on the news regularly advocating for uh, human rights change, like... Mark, Mark Grushy won it a few years ago, but a lot of times they're people who are just in their own communities, uh, doing work every day. Well, Dwight Ball and members of his cabinet met face to face with the nonprofit sector in St. John's today. A conference is underway focusing on the community sector as an industry, and the politicians who were there were told that changes are needed when it comes to funding. Cease here reports. From food banks to job placement programs, from sports groups to historical committees, and even a food truck. Nonprofit groups can be found in almost every sector of society. They contribute millions to the economy and employ 16,000 people in literally every corner of the province. Five Liberal cabinet ministers and the Premier took center stage, hearing the industry's concerns. For example, develop policies, but not with a one-size-fits-all mentality. We need that, that same funding program to be able to respond to my needs and somebody else's needs in St. John's. And right now, policy don't do that. So sometimes in order to get that funding, we're doing work that's not required or not needed in our area. 
Politicians were also told to develop a multi-year approach to funding instead of year to year. Community leaders say time is wasted on paperwork, filling out government application forms, taking away from those they're trying to help. The more time we can invest in what we're doing, rather than the paperwork, that's all good. And by the way, multi-year funding should save the provincial government a lot of effort having to review applications every year as well. So this is kind of win-win for everybody, right? Premier Ball told them a pilot project providing funding to 22 community groups looks encouraging. It has always been our plan to expand multi-year funding into other groups. These groups must have uh, accountability and transparency mechanisms in place so that we can report back uh, to people in Newfoundland and Labrador, the taxpayers in Newfoundland and Labrador, that that money is well spent. Conference organizers say the next step in the sector's development is identifying labor force needs, paid and unpaid, for the future. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. And we're live at that conference tonight. We'll hear from some participants about the challenges facing nonprofit organizations as well as getting volunteers. The Terranova Grannies are inviting you to come here to the Lantern for their Scrabble Tournament. It's all about grandmothers here in Newfoundland and Labrador helping grandmothers in Africa. These are people who lost their children during the AIDS crisis. 
And the Terra Nova Granny Scrabble Tourney uh, this Saturday at the Lantern, 35 Barnes Road. And uh, it starts at 2, goes until 5 o'clock. Admission is just $15. And don't worry, there are players of all levels. Well. Isn't this something? Some pictures from CBC's Under the Sea event for kids, which was held on the rooms over the weekend on Saturday, included a performance by the Swinging Bells. Yeah, and Chirp from CBC Kids made an appearance as well. 500 people showed up on Saturday morning. Yeah, look at them having a great time. <laughs> a bit of coloring, um, it's great music. Oh, a little green screen oh, there. Oh, the green screen. <laughs> there it Somebody is. Somebody took it away without telling Ashley. <laughs> Lots of smiles. Lots of fun, and uh, look forward to seeing a lot of you at uh, our next event. So stay tuned for information on that. Nice turnout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great spot, too, to have an event with uh, so many kids. Gorgeous view, too. Yeah, well, look at that. Aww. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Big red shoes. Uh, yeah. Did I, did I hear any music? I heard music, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's just seeing you again. It is. Uh, it's been a while. It I'm has. Sure it seems, right? Like a week it, Yeah. Was it cool this morning? It was chilly uh, for most of us, and we really haven't moved much in, in right. some areas, but others saw some, a beautiful afternoon. Let's take a look at the temperatures where you were sitting this morning at 6 a.m., uh, and you can see we have that cloud cover along the northeast coast as well. Temperatures around minus 2 for Corner Brook, and then they jumped up quite nicely through the afternoon. Now, along the northeast coast, because we're seeing that uh, low pressure system offshore. Those temperatures have not moved much at all. Uh, most of the afternoon sitting around the four degree mark. That's currently where we're sitting right now. And those temperatures along the uh, west coast, 10 degrees right now in Burgio and six for the rec house area. Uh, right now. So if we take a look at what the winds are going to do as we head through the night tonight. Now I mentioned that low pressure system offshore. That's actually going to move a little bit closer and that means those winds will pick up just a little bit more. So likely going to see gusts anywhere from 70 to 80 kilometers per hour along the northeast coast tonight. Uh, and then this parts of the south coast as well. We'll see uh, some of those stronger winds along the west coast. though. you're looking at those winds actually easing overnight. They're not going to be uh, too strong. And with uh, those cool, calm conditions, those temperatures are going to dip even more so tonight. So there's a look at the future tracker. You're seeing all that cloud cover again sticking around that risk of drizzle and um, cloud cover will continue. And then again, along the West Coast, as that ridge of high pressure stays pretty, uh, pretty stationary, we're going to see some nice uh, conditions tonight, but again, cool because of those clear skies and then up through Labrador, generally looking at the potential for some flurries overnight tonight and same thing for northern uh, northern Labrador. So here's a look at your temperatures overnight tonight. Five degrees for St. John's is where you should be sitting. Uh, we'll actually see those temperatures incre increase by a degree more than likely tonight. Minus four for Cornerbrook, three degrees for uh, Port of Basque, and then one degree for Grand Falls, Windsor. Now in lower lying areas, you'll likely see those temperatures dip below zero. Again, with that risk of uh, showers and or drizzle through the night, eventually going to see some clearing by morning for you. Lab City flurries tonight, minus one. And then again, up through northern uh, Labrador, either flurries or showers in the next couple of hours. And then as those temperatures dip, you'll likely see just the potential for some flurry. So over tomorrow, as we head through the day tomorrow, that low pressure system is actually going to move out. It's going to pull that wind with it. More than likely, won't see those winds easing for the metro area anyway until the evening or overnight. But uh, overall, we should see some sunny skies along the west and south coast tomorrow. You're going to stay generally gray up through Labrador with that uh, next weather maker moving moving in late day into Thursday, so uh, Wednesday rather. So here's a look at uh, tomorrow's forecast. Those northerly winds, like I said, 40 to about 70 kilometers per hour for most of the day. Eventually we will see some clearing uh, or some the winds easing. Seven degrees for Grand Falls winds are eight in Harbor Breton. Plenty of sunshine as you head towards the coast. Uh, 10 degrees, so, so those double digit temperatures expected along the west coast. Eight degrees for St. Anthony. So. A pretty beautiful day. You're going to see those temperatures climb up through Cartwright as well as uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Going to hang on to those cooler temperatures and that risk of showers and or flurries uh, for Lab West with uh, Nain reaching a high near 7 degrees. So that's a look at your forecast for now. Halloween's coming up. I'll have those detailed forecasts coming up. Well, nonprofit organizations across the province meeting today to talk about the economic and social contributions that those groups have on all of our communities. It's a three-day workshop where community leaders can network and learn about the industry as well as you heard earlier from Cecil Hare, express some concerns about funding 
Here now is Meg Roberts joins us live once again from the Delta Hotel where the summit is taking place. So Meg, what's, uh, what's this conference all about? Well, there's a lot that goes into running a nonprofit organization from the paperwork, recruiting volunteers, securing funding. Uh, the summit is trying to provide those community uh, organizations with some resources. So I'm now joined by Penny Rowe. She's the CEO of the Community Sector Council. Penny, how did a conference like this come to light? This is really a, bra a groundbreaking opportunity for the community sector. So many organizations, you know, 37 hundred registered organizations in the province every day are out making life better for the people in the province and you know there's not one of us who doesn't benefit every single day from some nonprofit organization the summit came about because we've started to look at all of those organizations collectively what we do as a group uh, for the province as opposed to just individual organizations with their individual mi missions so we've started to see the community sector quite equivalent to other industry sectors like technology or like forestry or like mining that have significant potential uh, to really contribute fully to the economy, whether it's attracting investment into their communities or whether it's about finding ways to create more work, more paid work in our labor force, and also about how we can support the unpaid labor force of our sector, which of course are our board members and our volunteers. What are you hoping that some of these community leaders get out of this summit? I think it's that sense of camaraderie. It's a sense of belonging to something bigger than just what they do themselves. And that's what I'm picking up from everybody. It's like, it's so tremendous to be in a room with all of our colleagues. But what was really important was this joint work plan, this joint effort that we're now engaged in with the provincial government. I mean, that's really, shows a tremendous amount of foresight on the part of this provincial government to actually acknowledge that we have more than that social or environmental benefit, that we are a significant part of the economy. And in fact, one of the primary objectives of the work plan is to see how we can increase the number of jobs within our community sector. And of course, that relates to making sure that the monies that we have are efficiently used, that we're not wasting a lot of time, doing things over and over and over again, for instance, applications for funding and so on, but rather that we can look to see where can we be sharper, where can we streamline the work that we do so that in fact our organizations can get stronger, the sector can get stronger, and more people can benefit from the work that so many organizations are doing. You have been in this uh, industry, I should say, for a long time now. So where, wh how has the nonprofit community sector changed in 20 years? As well, I can tell you how it's changed a lot longer than 20 years. Uh, certainly one of the things that the big trends we've seen uh, is that organizations, I think, are much more inclusive. The way in which we engage with people who might be deemed to be clients is very different. Uh, the way in which we try to work more collaboratively. Working collaboratively, of course, is, uh, requires a lot of time and skill. So that's one of the things that we're hoping is going to come out of this work plan that uh, we'll all sharpen up those abilities to collaborate and work more collectively. Perfect, perfect. That is Penny Rowe. She's the CEO, CEO of the Community Sector Council. Coming up later, we'll talk to one of those nonprofit organizations. Reporting live uh, in St. John's, I'm Meg Roberts for Here and Now. Well, these people and a room full of others had a direct and blunt message for the airlines this weekend bring back direct flights to Ireland. You'll hear their pitch in about 10 minutes.
Deep and Harvest Sea Farm says the cleanup of 2.6 million dead salmon on the south coast is complete. But video obtained by Here and Now raises questions about just how complete that cleanup really is. Now, we first brought you images last month after the company urged us to stay away from its fish cages. And this new footage isn't pretty either. Clancy Walker is with the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. That's an activist organization that seeks to end the destruction of habitat in the world's oceans. And Mr. Walker joins us from our location in Gander. Welcome to Here and Now. Thanks for having me on. So you've spent some time on the south coast over the past several days. What's your assessment of the situation down there? I would say that we're hearing from the company that the cleanup is complete, but after spending just a day there, we can see that there's been no cleanup effort made whatsoever on the beaches. They're all lined with about an inch of salmon fat and this sticky substance just gets onto everything and there's no way uh, I can see it coming off anytime soon. So can you give me a sense of, of why the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society would send you and some of your colleagues here to Newfoundland? What, what's the purpose? Um, well, we've run a campaign on the Pacific Coast called Virus Hunter. We've been running that campaign campaign now for four years and so when we heard about this mass die-off that was occurring here uh, on the Atlantic coast we thought that we should come over check it out because it seems like a pretty significant event but after seeing it firsthand um, I could say that this is actually what I would call a catastrophe um, yep. and yeah so Northern Harvest says that the cleanup is complete. As I mentioned in the introduction, 2.6 million dead fish have been removed. It sounds as though you aren't satisfied with that, that claim. There's no way that I would be satisfied with that as a cleanup. Um, like I said, there's just fat everywhere and there's no transparency in this industry. They say that 2.6 million fish died in this mass die-off, but we believe that number would actually be much, much more, probably millions more from the amount of this fatty substance that's stuck to everything. Now, you mentioned uh, aquaculture and your activism on, uh, on the West Coast. As you know, uh, this issue has come up about the whole idea that British Columbia should move towards a land-based type of aquaculture. What's your sense of the distinction between the Pacific fish farming situation versus here in the Atlantic? Anywhere that open net pen aquaculture has been installed in the world, we've seen wild fish stocks decline. And that is because when you have a sea cage, um, that is filled with such a high density of farmed salmon, interactions between the farmed salmon and the wild salmon spread disease. And the farmed salmon, because there's, like I said, such a high density, they will incubate that disease, they will amplify that disease, and it will spread to wild populations. So if we focus only on one coast of Canada, we're missing the whole picture, I think. So it was good to come over here to check it out, to collect some samples that we'll have analyzed, and um, hopefully just put the pressure on Canada as a whole to remove this industry. Now, the company has tried to portray itself as a victim of climate change, saying that warm weather is what killed so many of its fish. What lesson do you think we should take away from, from this massive fish kill? I think that with the climate crisis that is emerging right now, uh, we need to take this as a warning and we can expect much, much more of this. If we don't take this kind of industry and this catastrophe seriously, we can only expect these situations to worsen and to become more frequent because the unpredictability of conditions and farming conditions, especially when you're in a wild environment like the ocean, there's just no control and there's no regulations in place or very, very few regulations in place for the aquaculture industry and we just can't allow them to continue to operate because everything wild will suffer. All right, Mr. Walker, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, Premier Dwight Ball said today that the government will hold Northern Harvest Sea Farms responsible for ensuring that the area is cleaned up. So we will be monitoring this. We have people there too uh, that to make sure that when the industry or when this company says that its work is done, it is now done. Uh, so we've learned some lessons in the past on that about communications. Uh, so right now it's up to us as the regulator to make sure that when the company says it's done, well, it is actually done. Now, we've made several requests to Provincial Fisheries Minister Jerry Byrne for an interview, and we are still waiting to hear back from him. In other news, people who are deaf in the province say the English school district is discriminating against some students. 
The parents went to the school district's annual general meeting this weekend to say they feel the board discriminates against deaf students by having too few American Sign Language resources in schools. The school board says it's trying to give every student the best education possible. A new steering committee has been created to see what improvements can be made, but parents of deaf students say they weren't invited. Feel that we are key stakeholders as parents of a deaf child, that we feel we need a position at the table so we can discuss and be involved in any decisions that will affect the future of our child. Well, meanwhile, the board is considering some school closures in the province. It will be reviewing schools in several areas of the province to see if the resources are being used efficiently. Those are in the Marystown, Stephenville and Pillies Island, as well as Carmenville and Glovertown areas. The school board will look at the student populations and figure out if it's possible to relocate them. What we want to do is go and talk to people first. We, we don't have any conclusions formed. Uh, Resulting from a review, it could be something, a, a catchment change could occur, a boundary change, could be uh, grade levels that are adjusted, or it could potentially mean that one or more schools might close. Well, people who want to see the direct flight between St. John's and Ireland reinstated are putting together a plan. Over the weekend, about 70 people gathered at the Benevolent Irish Society to discuss their next steps. WestJet cancelled its direct route from the province about a year ago and Air Canada stopped its transatlantic flight from St. John's when Boeing grounded its 737 MAX model. There's a lot of Irish ancestry in this province but people at the meeting say bringing back a direct flight is about more than simply Irish heritage. The direct flight is very important. Originally it was the focus was on tourism but now the focus has become on tourism, business, education and innovation in this province because the economy of Newfoundland depends on access to Europe as well as to North America. Well, now the group has gathered more than 2,300 signatures on its petition and it plans to present that to the provincial government this week. Dozens of nonprofits are meeting in St. John's. These tables will be full tomorrow. We're going to meet with a nonprofit coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back. We are going to return to the Delta Hotel where my colleague Meg Roberts is. There's a conference regarding nonprofits in the province taking place there, and they're looking at a way to enhance the sector both socially as well as economically. So, Meg, what's up? Well, there are about 37 registered nonprofits in the province. 16,000 people are employed by the sector, and 200,000 people volunteer. A lot of those people are meeting here. Uh, that's including the founder of Sharing Our Cultures. It's a, a group that promotes multiculturalism in the province. How many uh, volunteers would work f would uh, partner with your organization? Oh, we'll have over a hundred volunteers, and that that includes not only our volunteer elected board of directors, as well as our advisory committee, and all the students who participate, all volunteer. How tough is it to get volunteers? Well, it is because everyone is competing for the same volunteers that you want. And uh, volunteers now, particularly young adults, they're very busy. They've got uh, part-time jobs. They've got other um, organizations that they're involved with and school activities. So, yeah, it is a challenge sometimes. You've been involved for a long time. You guys just had your 20th anniversary. Uh, so the demand for volunteers, how has that changed over the years? Oh, it has increased because there have been more community organizations formed. There have been more um, organizations that need volunteers to actually thrive. So the number of people looking for volunteers has increased. So that has changed. What's the hardest part about running a, a nonprofit? Oh, apart from getting volunteers, well, I think it's the constant writing of proposals so we can get funding because um, our organization does not have core funding. So every project, every program, every event, we have to write um, proposals to be able to get um, funding and we have to be relevant within the community as well. So you're writing proposals, they've got to know that what you're planning to do, your project, your program is relevant, is needed in the community and has an impact. Why was it important for you to come out to a conference like this one? Oh, very important because I do need the professional learning. I do need the opportunity to network with others, to collaborate with others. Like uh, yesterday, I learned um, conflict resolution, which is great because we have an elected board. We have uh, so many volunteers, so that's what you want to, to know. And today we learned about how we can measure the impact of our organization. So I've always found that the community sector, Council of Newfoundland and Labrador, Whenever they have a program, a project, uh, a summit like this, I know that I'm going to learn something new and I'm going to be able to be better and more professional about what I do as well as meet more people. So it's been great. You were saying to me a little earlier today also that the networking has been essential in terms of getting volunteers. Uh, we had that conversation a little earlier. Can you explain that to me? Yes. Well, uh, since June, I've been actually looking for volunteers. I wanted volunteers from the indigenous community, the francophone community, and from individuals that identify themselves as uh, living with a disability and I couldn't find any since June and I arrived here yesterday I met someone who said I can get you two youth to be on your committee and then someone else this morning says oh you need some indigenous young people I'll get them for you and I ended up having someone from the francophone community as well sitting around my table so that actually is great because I get that opportunity to get yeah. the volunteers I was looking for that I didn't have four months down the road Lovely, yes. lovely. Well, that was the founder of Sharing Our Cultures. Tomorrow is the last day of the conference, and then it's back to work for these hardworking individuals. Anthony. All right, Meg, thank you very much. It's uh, Meg Roberts reporting live from downtown St. John's. Bridget was actually in the hospital when she was three days old. Her knees were like footballs. She couldn't bend her arms. We're checking back in with people whose lives have changed in an instant. She had uh, genetic mutation and she was first in the world diagnosed. Had a bone marrow transplant when she was two and a half. And to see where they are today. After that transplant, she, she was pretty much 100% cured. I really like the acting in that. That's my favorite part. I enjoy it. Bridget Park on the next segment of This Is My Story. Coming up on Here and Now.
Yeah, I like that. It's, it it's kind of right up. So starting next week. Yeah, we're bringing back our weather whiz kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all the drawings and all that again? That's right. Yeah, email us your drawings. Send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Include your name, age, photo, and don't forget the drawing. And we'll feature as many of them as we can on Here and Now. I like that. That's you your own little theme going there. That's great. That's good. It's always fun. Yeah. I want to go to Mayberry, but you probably don't understand what that reference is, right? Mayberry? Yeah. Tell her on Twitter. <laughs> I know there's I'm a dating song. myself. There's a song called Mayberry, but that's probably not it. So we complain a bit about here, but other parts of Canada, <laughs> colder. Much colder. Yeah, let's take a look at the setup. Uh, we'll take a look at what we're seeing right now. We've got a low pressure system just bringing cold, cold air uh, through most of the prairies and uh, yeah. The good thing is, is where that jet stream is, is we're seeing some of that warmer air. So if we take a look at those temperatures, Minus 10 right now in Calgary, minus 8 in Fort Mac. Yeah, these cool temperatures. Uh, the good news is we're not going to see them here. And again, that's because of where the jet stream is. Those temperatures are actually going to stay uh, quite mild for most of us through the day tomorrow. 10 degrees for Corner Brook. But that low pressure system sitting off of our coast is uh, keeping some cooler temperatures for St. John's. Only going to reach a high near, uh, or yeah, high near six degrees. And then with some of those stronger winds continuing out of the north, about 40 to 70 kilometers per hour through the day, eventually those winds will ease as that low moves off and a ridge of high pressure that's just sitting uh, to the west of the island will uh, move in, or at least move a little bit further uh, east. Other than that, as we head through the day on Wednesday, the next weather maker will move in for parts of uh, Labrador. So we're going to see the potential for some showers and even some flurries move in with that. That moves through quite quickly through the day on Wednesday. And then we start to see some of that cloud cover push back in again for the West Coast. So that's more than like when, when we'll see most of that uh, cloud cover move in. Then the next system will move in for Thursday. This is just in time for Halloween. It does look like it'll be cool, especially up through Labrador. So this could be a, a accumulating snow event for Happy Valley Goose Bay, uh, even towards Lab West again. To the south of that, though, it should stay as rain, but it does look like some showers will move in just in time for trick-or-treating. But the temperatures right now as well will more than likely stay quite warm, uh, sitting around maybe 9 to 10 degrees by the time the trick-or-treaters get out and uh, enjoy that. So here's a look at your Wednesday forecast. Going to see temperatures slowly climbing uh, along the northeast coast. 9 degrees for Gander, 7 for St. John's and then 10 for Corner Brook. I'm gonna see that potential for either rain or flurries up through northern portion of Nain, and that will happen in the morning. But uh, over the next couple of days, we're actually gonna see a little bit of a warm up there. It is uh, for Thursday for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. Have it generally staying uh, partly cloudy through the day. And then Friday, some wind and rain will move in. Looks like 14 degrees, but then by Saturday, a big dip in those temperatures yet again. Central Newfoundland, you're looking at a similar forecast. Friday, 12 degrees, and then that dip as we head into Saturday, but it does look like sunshine should come right along with that. And then for Western Newfoundland, uh, overnight lows are going to dip right back down for Friday and Saturday. Five degrees will be the afternoon high for you. For Eastern Labrador, 11 degrees by Wednesday, and then we start to see that system move in. That's when things change and those temperatures dip with that chance of flurries moving in. And then for uh, Western Labrador, again, by Thursday and Friday, that's like looking like when we're going to see the most accumulation, but uh, we definitely have a few days to get into that. So when I come back, I'll have all the details on your beautiful weather photo. Thanks, Ashley. Well, diecast diehards met in St. John's on Saturday to trade toys as well as tales about their shared hobby. On Facebook, there are 400 members of a group for dinky collectors in the province and dozens of them headed to the swap at a St. John's car dealership to buy, sell and see thousands of miniature machines. Here now is Katie Breen spoke with some of them. I started this uh, about five and a half years ago. Uh, it's a Facebook group, just an idea that uh, myself and another uh, buddy had at the time. And wondered if we should go ahead with it or not. It was just a few of us as collectors at the time. And uh, so we wanted to promote what we were interested in. Started off small and it's gradually more collectors and more collectors came on. Now we're close to 500 members. I have two very large rooms. I mean, they're wall-to-wall -wall cabinets and uh, yeah, I have, I can't even tell you the amount. That's 
that many? I've always been a car guy. I kind of grew up around cars, and it's uh, a way to get, uh, well, I guess one car you can't afford, and it's just, uh, it's a really neat community that, uh, that we have, and uh, it's, it's fun to collect. Why are you here? Because I want to get some dinkies. Yeah? Why do you like dinkies? Um, because, um, because they're cool. What's the coolest thing about them? Um, because, um, they can drive. Yeah? yeah? What do you do with yours? Um, I play with them. Look at the colors. It's absolutely beautiful, and I'm sure it's a woman's dream to have a nice sports car and can't afford one, so you got to go the cheapest route and have dinkies. <laughs> All right, uh, to a very serious story now in national and international news tonight. We are learning more about the U.S. operation, which ended with the death of ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Officials in Pentagon briefed reporters this afternoon, and there were new revelations about prisoners taken during the raid. There were two uh, adult males taken off the objective, alive, and they're in our custody. Officials also confirmed the existence of a video of the operation. They said it's currently being declassified. There are also some questions about al-Baghdadi's remains. There are unconfirmed reports of a burial at sea. Officials would only say the disposal of the remains was completed and that it was handled, quote, appropriately. While the reporters didn't get any details about the military canine that was wounded during the operation, Donald Trump tweeted a photo of the dog that he says was involved in the mission. The state of California is under siege at both ends. In the south, wildfires are encroaching on the wealthy neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And in the north, windy conditions have worsened the already massive blaze raging in wine country. We have the National Guard as well as firefighters uh, from a number of neighboring states now here at the fire. Uh, our numbers have been brought up to over 4,000 firefighters here uh, battling this fire. 200,000 people have been forced to flee their homes in Sonoma County. About 2.5 million people have no electricity and nearly 100 buildings have been destroyed. On Sunday, the governor declared a state of emergency. High winds are adding to the woes as crews battle to contain multiple fires across Northern California. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, a fast-moving bushfire destroyed several homes near the Getty Museum. Officials say a mix of dry and windy conditions are causing the fires to spread quickly. Well, we want to know where you're to. Take a look at this beautiful, dramatic October sky. I'll tell you where this was taken when we come back.
Welcome back. Just before the break, we showed you this beautiful photo. I see the houses, but really not an idea. <laughs> It was taken in Twilling Gate. Beautiful Twilling Gate. Beautiful Twilling Gate, yes. Thank you to, uh, so much to Rosalind Hopkins for sending that gorgeous photo in. And if you have any you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yeah, please do. And I hope you have a great night uh, <laughs> Monday. So obviously, whole week yet to go. And Halloween. Fun week. Coming is coming. <laughs> have a great night. Good night.